Uh, I'm sure you've heard of the Da Vinci Code. What I'm going to talk about tonight is the Dryden Code. And this is a language conspiracy unmasked. You're the first to hear of it. Tom Hanks will play in the movie, I'm sure. Uh, I'll give time afterwards for plenty of questions. I always like to get a dialogue going with an audience. Much more fun. Let me quickly review some time-honored grammar rules that we've all learned. Never use double negatives. Never use double comparatives, or better. Be careful to distinguish who, which, and that. Use shall with the pronoun I for the simple future, and use will to signal determination. In the second and third person, reverse that. Never end a sentence with a preposition. Between signifies two items, among signifies three. And above all, never split an infinitive. I'm not normally a conspiracy buff, but I've stumbled across a 300-year-old conspiracy that few people, especially English teachers, have noticed. Let me set the scene by starting with four quotes from some prominent early conspirators. John Dryden, the British poet, set the plot in motion. In 1672, referring to William Shakespeare, he said, I dare almost challenge any man to show me a page together which is correct in both sense and language. And what correctness can there be from Shakespeare or from Fletcher? I'll therefore spare my own trouble of inquiring into their faults. If they live now, doubtless, they would write more correctly. <laughs> First comment. In 1712, conspirator number two, Jonathan Swift, complained, our language is extremely imperfect. Its daily improvements are less than its daily corruptions. Everything is abuse and absurdity. It offends against every part of grammar. He also believed, quote, there is no absolute necessity why any language should be perpetually changing. Conspirator number three, the Earl of Chesterfield, 1712. It must be admitted that our language is at present in a state of anarchy. Conspirator number four, Samuel Johnson, 1755. I found our speech copious, without order, energetic, without rules. Wherever I turned my view, there was perplexity to be disentangled and confusion to be regulated. Other writers, among them Joseph Addison, Daniel Defoe, did not hesitate to use terms such as corrupt, unrefined, and barbarous when referring to English. You can feel the indignation and that lower lip quivering when they talk like this. These men and others like them were actually humiliated by what they considered to be a degenerate language. They planned to do something about it. Hence, the conspiracy. Words like chaos, anarchy, unregulated abomination were not being tossed about lightly. In 18th century England, there was a deep social phobia about disorder. This wasn't mere hyperbole. After 150 years of social and political upheaval, the British were truly uneasy. In that 150 year period, they had endured the Reformation, the dissolution of monasteries, and the rise of life-threatening religious persecution, the gunpowder plot, two civil wars, the execution of a king, Charles I, Irish and Scottish rebellions, three wars with the Dutch, the Restoration, the Great Plague and Fire of London, and the Glorious Revolution of 1688. And meanwhile, across the ocean, the pesky colonials in America were beginning to act up. So the desire to stabilize every facet of society, to restore order and predictability to everyday life was a primary goal. It was a dream of an entire generation. And language was an easy target because the large number of social climbers and newly rich yearning to be accepted into the upper or nearly 
upper class. So here's the core of the conspiracy. The gentleman mentioned previously, and two more to be named, made up the rules with which we started, made them up. They chose them arbitrarily, ignoring history, and deliberately made it seem that there was no choice. Follow their rules, and you were right. Ignore their rules, and you were wrong. It was that simple. It all began to fall into place. The half century between 1750 and 1800 saw more English grammars published than in the previous 200 years. And all of them attempted to repair what was seen as a severely damaged language. Two grammar books in particular set norms that lasted 300 years. Robert Loth wrote a short introduction to English grammar in 1762. By 1800, it had gone through 45 editions. My best book so far has gone through two. <laughs> His work inspired Lindley Murray to write English grammar adapted to different classes of learners in 1784. Murray was an interesting guy. He was a New York lawyer who retired for health reasons to Hogate, England. He wrote the grammar book for students at a local girls' school, but it caught on fire. It went through 200 editions by 1850, and it sold over 20 million copies. Susan, my publisher back there, is cringing. 20 <laughs> million copies. Now, for comparison, Gone with the Wind, one of the best American novels, selling novels, sold approximately 28 million. He sold 20 million of a grammar. Okay. It influenced every grammar book written until the last part of the 20th century, over and over. Don't use double negatives. Don't split an infinitive. Ah, Loth and Murray clucked at the sloppy grammar of Shakespeare, Milton, Dryden, Pope, Addison, Swift, and everyone else except themselves. Most of their choices were based on personal preference. They would explain, this is harsh, avoid it. This is elegant, do it. Or they used the big stick on occasion. This is how it's done in Latin. <laughs> they considered Latin the perfect language. The problem is the structure of English, the structure, has no connection to Latin structure. English is an analytic language. This means it depends primarily upon where you put the words in the sentence to make sense. Latin is a synthetic language. To make sense of what you read in Latin, you have to pay attention to the word endings. And you can put the words anywhere in the sentence and not ruin the meaning. For an example, if I say, the farmer loves the young lady, that's one reality. If I say, the young lady loves the farmer, he may not know she exists. If I say, the, the, loves, young lady, farmer, it makes no sense whatsoever. You could do that in Latin and still make sense. So to say, this is how it's done in Latin, absolutely irrelevant to English grammar. Now, if you don't pay attention to the word order or the word choice, you will run into some problems. I'll give you some examples. While riding my bike through the park, a black cat crossed in front of me. How did it get on my bike? Spattered with paint, my mother cleaned the window pane. I saw a dead deer driving down I-75 <laughs> from a famous novel. At the beginning of the novel, Tom Joad comes across a turtle on his way home from spending four years in prison. <laughs> After reading the paper, the rain ceased. Hopping briskly through the vegetable garden, I saw a toad. Covered in cream cheese, my friends will love these bagels. <laughs> and we saw several iguanas on vacation in Mexico. <laughs> now, individual word choice matters, too. I mean, you don't want to get paranoid. But parents try to install these virtues in their children. No, instill. He became affluent in French, Italian, Latin, and Greek. I don't think that's the word you want. My parents are alike and indifferent to it.